So we're going to take a little bit of a detour and discuss vector fields and their relationships to sort of more physical applications. Uh, and what we'll do is we will consider the relationship between vector fields and sets of differential equations. And when we do this, what we want to look at is sort of if a system is in some initial condition, what's going to happen to it as the system evolves in time? And frequently, what happens is that such a system of differential equations is accurately, to some extent, modeled by a vector field. So we make the definition. Given a vector field, which again is nothing more than just a function from Rn to Rn, an integral curve of the vector v through the point C in Rn consists of an open set which we think of as some amount of time, so an open subset of R with zero in U and a differentiable function which is a curve which we think of as what happens to our initial condition as a function of time gamma from U to Rn satisfying the conditions that, well, initially at time t equals zero, we are at our initial point. And secondly, the derivative of this function is equal to what the value of that vector field is at that point. The derivative of the vector the derivative of the, uh, the curve as a function of time is given by the value of the vector field at that point in time for all t in u. So as soon as we look at this curve, so we'll give an example sort of um, impressionistically if we have a vector field, let's say it looks maybe something like this. Right? Doesn't, in this definition, we don't make any assumptions about this vector field being differentiable, but um, often it will be. So imagine we have a vector field like this, and then we consider uh, sort of an arbitrary initial condition, let's say here. Then what we're trying to find is we're trying to find some amount of time that we can follow these trajectory lines and follow our curve. So we hope that there exists some curve that passes through that point, and when we take its derivative at every point, then the derivative equals that vector field. So the vector field is sort of dictating how we expect this um, system to evolve as a function of time, and it follows some specific dynamics. And in some of the examples, you'll see the relationship between these kinds of vector fields and from classical physics, Hamiltonian flows, which dictate how a particular physical system evolves as a function of time, namely its position and its momentum, how they evolve as a function of time. But before we get to those examples, let's consider briefly the following one. which is sort of a simple example uh, in some sense. So let's say v at x, y is given by y minus x for all x and y in, in R2. So what does this look like? So if I tried to plot this vector field, and I drew the x and y axis like this, 
then it would say, well, if I pick, let's say at zero, let's go zero comma one, then that would say that the vector field points one in the direction into the right and nothing in the second coordinate. So that looks something like this. And then if I go to one comma zero, well, one comma zero gets into zero negative one, so that looks like this. And zero comma negative one gets sent to negative one comma zero. That means that looks something like this. And you can sort of see the pattern that what we're going to have is we have this vector field and as you go out these lines get larger and larger so at 2 the magnitude increases by 2 and so on. So here 2 increases twice and as you get closer it also gets smaller. It gets cut in half here. Here it gets cut in half. So we sort of, after plotting a bunch of points, we get a visualization for what all of the vectors look like at every single point. And you can see that we have this sort of circular motion. So you might guess that an integral curve, let's say if we went through any point such as this one, then it should follow these lines. And it seems like it'll even follow them in some sort of a circular pattern. And we'll, we're about to show that this is indeed the case that all of the integral curves satisfy this periodic condition. So let's try to find out what these curves are. So what we're looking for is we're looking for some domain. We don't yet know what the domain is, so let's just keep that as a variable in some sense. And suppose we have such a, a curve. What we want to do is we want to solve for gamma satisfying gamma of 0 equals some number. And let's just be concrete. Let's say that number is 0, 1. Let's say that vector is 0, 1. And the derivative of gamma at any point in time, t, is equal to the value of the vector field at that time. So it's supposed to be V gamma of T. So what does this all mean? Well, because I have a function from R to R2, it's determined by its component functions. So this situation alone tells me if I write the X coordinate of this vector as X and the Y coordinate as Y, then this tells me that X of 0 equals 0 and y of 0 equals 0. That's what we get from the first equation. From the second equation, we get a similar condition. We get another condition, rather. And this implies that x prime at t equals the value of the vector field. So we take uh, our vector field at gamma t, and that's exactly y so we get this condition and the second if we look at the second coordinate it's y prime at t equals according to this it says negative x t so we want to solve for two functions functions of the variable t function x and the function y that satisfy these four conditions one way of solving this system is by turning it into a second order differential equation. And what I mean by that is if we take, for instance, the first function and we take its derivative again, so in this case what we're doing, mathematically speaking, is now we're assuming that our function is twice differentiable for the purposes of this calculation. So we have x double prime t, and this has to be true for all t, by the way in some domain, which we still have to figure out. So x double prime t equals y prime t, but y prime t equals negative x t. And a similar equation holds if we plug in y prime, y double prime will get equals negative y. Uh, y. So what's a solution of this equation? A solution of this equation well, think about it like this. If you have a function of a single variable and you take its derivative twice, 
and you get back that same function multiplied by minus 1, what are some examples of those functions? Well, if you think about it, the only two examples I can come up with are any linear combination of sine and cosine. So that's actually an infinite number of solutions um, parameterized by the two free variables in their um, first and second coordinates. So the solutions are x of t equals a cosine t plus b sine t. And we get a similar equation for the y coordinate. Now, now the question is how do we actually use our initial conditions here? We know that at x of 0 we get 0 back. So this initial condition implies, so the initial condition implies that one of these coefficients is 0. When we plug in t equals 0, cosine is 1, so that, and then sine is 0, so we get the condition 0 equals a. This implies that a equals 0. Similarly, we'll have y of t equals c cosine t plus d sine t, and this implies that c equals 0. And now I see that I made a mistake. This initial condition says y at 0 equals 1. So let's write that here. And that changes what happens here, of course. Because at 0, this becomes c, this becomes 0. That implies that c equals 1. So we have these two um, results x of t equals b sine t and y of t equals cosine t plus d sine t. Right? So here we've used the two initial conditions and we still have two unknowns left. How do we figure out what those unknowns are? Well, we still have these original differential equations. If we take the first derivative of x with respect to t, we should obtain y. That's going to give us a relationship between the coefficients b and d. And similarly, if we take the derivative of y, uh, then we equate it to negative x, we'll get another equation that relates x, that relates b and d together. So let's call these conditions, um, this is our actual um, ODE. Let's call that ODE. So ODE implies, so take, let's look at x. x prime equals b cosine t. So b cosine t equals y t, for all t. So this is saying that we get cosine t plus d sine t for all t. If we set t equals 0, we see that b has to be equal to 1 automatically. So this implies b is 1. So already we already got something for free. Now let's look at the equation for y. If we take this derivative, we will get that y prime is negative sine t plus d cosine t equals negative xt, and negative xt is minus sine t. So this is equal to minus sine t. And then we can evaluate this at t equals 0. And if we plug in this is 0, this is 0, then d equals 0 is what is implied by this equation. So now we can put these results together. We've solved for all of our unknowns, a, b, c, and d. And that means we can get an expression for what gamma is as a function of time. So gamma, if we plug in, is x of t, which is, according to this calculation, sine of t, cosine of t. And so this equation is describing, so as t equals 0, I start off here, and as t is increasing, cosine of t begins to decrease, and sine of t begins to increase. 
So that's consistent with this picture up until we reach, let's say, pi over 2. And at pi over 2, cosine is 0, which is the y-coordinate here, and sine of t is 1, which is the x-coordinate here. And now what happens if I increase pi over 2? Well, if you increase by pi over 2, then cosine is becoming negative, so the y-coordinate is becoming negative, and the x-coordinate is also positive, and it's decreasing. So this, I believe that this equation is indeed consistent. But we can always check, right? All we have to do is this is our x, this is our y of t, and we check if the derivative of this is equal to this. Well, if you take this derivative, then the first coordinate derivative of sine is cosine, and that's exactly y. And then if we go to cosine, we take that derivative, that's minus sine, that's exactly minus um, the x-coordinate. So this is indeed consistent, and it satisfies our initial condition at 0. And so this is an example of an integral curve of this vector field through the point 0, 1. And you can look at all integral curves of this vector field, and they're all going to be concentric circles. And one of the important things about these integral curves is that they are periodic, which means that there exists some time, capital T, for example, at which if I evaluate gamma at t and then I add that time t, I get back to where I started. So it's periodic in that sense.